Okay. Okay, good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee meeting. Uh, my name is Councilmember Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of the committee. We have been joined by our, my colleagues, Councilmember Farrah Lewis, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Councilmember Barry Gredenchuk. Today the committee will be considering four pieces of legislation, all with the aim of improving communication and outreach between the Department of Finance and property owners throughout the city. The four bills are Intro 952, sponsored by Councilmember Vallone, which would require DOF to provide notice by telephone to property owners who need to renew their senior citizen and disabled homeowner property tax exemptions. Intro 1225, which I have sponsored, which would require DOF to make best efforts to collect and maintain the name, telephone number, and email addresses of every property owner in the city, or that same information for an individual authorized to receive communications about the property on behalf of the owner. Three, uh, intro number 1702, sponsored by Council Member Koslowitz, which would require DOF to put a notice on the July 1st property tax bill when such bill is calculated using a tax rate for a prior fiscal year. And four, intro 1705, sponsored by Council Member Matteo, which would require DOF to establish and maintain an opt-in system for property owners to receive a receipt when a payment is made towards the, their statement of account and to notify owners about the availability of such system. In recent years, under the leadership of Commissioner Jacques Gia, the Department of Finance has placed a clear emphasis on customer service. This is evidenced in the agency's mission statement to administer the tax and revenue laws fairly, efficiency, efficiently, and transparently to instill public confidence and encourage compliance while providing exceptional customer service. Because of this focus, DOF has enacted many customer-friendly reforms in the past several years, oftentimes in collaboration with the Council. These initiatives have been wide-ranging in scope, from the launch of the Office of Taxpayer Advocate to help taxpayers solve their tax issues after they have tried to fix them with DOF on their own, to the ability to complete many property tax exemption forms and applications online, to the property tax and interest deferral program that allows low-income taxpayers to defer or reduce property tax payments. Nevertheless, the city's property tax system remains, a complicated and remains complicated and difficult to understand. So when it comes to providing clarity and transparency to property owners and ensuring that communication is clear and efficient, there's always room for improvement. On intro 1225 in particular, which I have sponsored, I want to stress the importance of being able to communicate with property owners, not just through physical mailings, but to make use of all methods available. When there are time-sensitive notices, like information about the lien sale or tax benefit renewals, it is imperative that we have the ability to get in touch quickly. We have all heard the an anecdotes of the constituents who won't open that envelope from the tax collection agency or who have moved or haven't alerted DOF to their new mailing address and have therefore not received their notices. I understand that collecting email and telephone information is also a priority for the commissioner and I look forward to continuing to work with him on this effort and on the other issues addressed by the bills under consideration today. Do any of the other bill sponsors wish to make a statement about their legislation? I don't, uh, Councilman Vallone? Yep, would you like to make a statement? Yes, Chair Drum, good morning, thank you very much, uh, especially for including intro 952 in today's hearing. Um, as we know, the cost of living in New York City rises every year and one, every one of our homeowners has called every one of our council members to say, we need some help. Every two years, the homeowner's exemption must be renewed, and especially at these times, we are trying to defend our most vulnerable population, seniors and disabled homeowners. Currently, the Department of Finance mails out their renewal for, for every other year. However, if that piece of mail is misplaced, constituents can lose their exemption without any additional notice. For the 2019-2020 tax year of the 39,000 property owners who needed to renew um, SCHE, which we call SCHE, 9.8% of the benefit recipients failed to renew. So that almost 10% of our seniors did not renew because of a misplaced pet. Well, when I saw that, that was the uh, nuance for this bill. This alarming statistic, uh, trying to take steps to take the next step to see how we can prevent that from happening. Communication is always the key, and I believe this bill will address the issue profoundly. We aim to expand the notice requirements to include a simple phone call from the department so as not to leave an eligible senior behind. 
Intro 952 would require the Department of Finance by no later than November 15th of every year to provide notice of renewal by phone to property owners required to renew their benefits. Such notice would include, at a minimum, information regarding the mailing of the renewal application to the property owner, the filing deadline for the renewal application, and contact information in the event the renewal application is not received. Once again, thank you, Chair Drum, and I look forward to hearing the testimonies today. Okay, thank you very much. We've been joined by Minority Leader Steve Matteo as well. And uh, we will now hear from the Department of Finance after they are sworn in by counsel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay, thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair Drum and members of the Committee on Finance. I am Michael Hyman, first Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Finance. I am joined by Leslie Zimmerman, Assistant Commissioner for Payment Operations, and Sheila Feinberg, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. DOF's mission is to administer the tax and revenue laws of the city fairly, efficiently, and transparently to instill public confidence and encourage compliance while providing exceptional customer service. This package of bills is in alignment with our mission, and we appreciate the Council's desire to help us improve our service and provide more New Yorkers with the support and the benefits they need. We would like to discuss opportunities to achieve some of the bill's objectives by building on recent DOF initiatives, including the launch of DOF's new property tax system and the expansion of its customer relationship management program. These initiatives have helped us do a better job serving the hundreds of thousands of homeowners, entrepreneurs, motorists, and others who interact with our agency. We welcome the opportunity to work with the Council to refine these bills and leverage existing customer service programs and initiatives at the Department of Finance. I will now address each bill before the committee today. Intro 1225. This bill will require the Department of Finance to make its best efforts to collect contact information for all owners of real property and ensure the information is housed in a computer database to administer the real property tax. The bill further stipulates that these, quote, best efforts shall include, at a minimum, a field soliciting the above listed contact information on all hard copy and online forms, applications, and other documents related to the recording of any deed-related or mortgage-related document or the administration of the real property tax, end quote, and on forms from other property-owned interactions with the department. In compliance with Local Law 26 of 2018, DOF currently mails new homeowners welcome packages, which include information about property taxation, assessment, and the exemptions available to eligible homeowners. This mailing also includes an invitation to sign up for an electronic DOF customer service account. Property owners provide email addresses and telephone numbers as part of registration, and owners can use the account to update mailing address information. Approximately 10,000 new homeowners receive this mailing each month. The customer relationship management system was established to allow DOF to better serve and satisfy its customers. The nearly 60,000 customers who have created customer service accounts are now able to submit questions and requests to DOF online, upload documents related to their inquiries, and track the status of their cases 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Once we have resolved a customer's inquiry, DOF works to update our system based on information provided by the customer to ensure that his or her record is up to date. We are open to exploring new ways to encourage property owners to update their contact information, but we want to steer owners to our customer services portal. Intro 952. This bill will require the Department of Finance to provide notice of Shahi and Dahi renewals by telephone no later than November 15th of each year. DOF already conducts a very robust outreach effort to help owners renew their benefits, and this, combined with the redesign and simplification of our renewal application mailings, helped us achieve a 94% renewal rate last year. We regularly partner with elected officials and community organizations to host enrollment events, and we share lists with council staff so that you can help us reach constituents who still need to renew. In addition, with the launch of the Department of Finance new property tax system, homeowners can now apply for or renew their tax exemptions online. DOF believes that adding a robocall will present operational challenges for the agency without producing commensurate benefits for the customer. Most importantly, DOF is concerned that some homeowners may be alarmed by the calls if they are perceived as scams, 
as many robocall scammers prey on seniors and people with disabilities. As such, DOF is opposed to this bill, but we hope to continue with the council <coughs> increasing the, to increase the renewal rate even beyond its current 94% rate so that no homeowner entitled to property tax exemptions are left behind. Intro 1702. This legislation requires the Department of Finance to send property owners a statement of account with new language making clear in the July 1 bill that the taxes due are based on a calculation used in the tax rate from the prior fiscal year, when prior year rates are used, which is frequently the case, that the taxes are subject to adjustment upon the adoption of the tax rate for the new fiscal year, and that a subsequent bill issued during the course of the new tax year may reflect the adjusted amount of tax due in the new tax rate. DOF supports this bill and believes it will increase transparency for taxpayers. We will need to work with Council on language that can be included in the bill so that we do not overwhelm customers with information or add additional pages to the bill. Intro 1705. This legislation would require the Department of Finance to provide email or print receipts when customers pay their property tax bills. DOF would also be required to notify owners of the availability of the receipt on the statement of account. I would like to share with the Council what we currently do to notify taxpayers that their payments have been received. Currently, if anyone makes a payment at a DOF business center, the customer will receive a receipt with detailed information about the amount of the payment and the BBL associated with the payment. If a taxpayer chooses to make a payment online, he or she will receive an email receipt of the payment. Furthermore, customers can view their payments and account histories online via the Department of Finance's new property tax system at www.myc.gov slash New York City property. DOF is working on ways to make it easier for property owners to view and download info on property tax payments made. Finally, DOF is working to enhance the customer service portal that I referenced earlier. We are working to give customers the option of receiving ongoing updates from the department on subjects of interest to them in the area of property tax exemptions, business taxes, and more. We also plan to introduce a chat feature to answer customers' questions in real time. We believe that this system provides the tool that we need to communicate important information with customers, and we can develop ways to give property owners user-friendly access to information on their property tax payments through the system. We will be continuing to market and improve the portal so that more customers create accounts and build relationships with the department in this way. In summary, the Department of Finance shares the Council's goal to provide better, more efficient, and more transparent service to our customers. Many of these bills build upon the work we have already done to enhance our service, and we look forward to partnering with the Council to improve and implement them. Thank you for your continued commitment and partnership and for the opportunity to testify today. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner, uh, for that information. And uh, we see that you're in agreement with a number of the uh, pieces of legislation, although, as you said, you want to fine-tune some of it. So let me start off by asking just a couple of questions on um, the uh, contact um, information collection. Uh, what does DOF currently do to try to collect telephone and email addresses of property owners or their designees? I know that you mentioned one um, item in your, um, in your testimony. Uh, and you, I think in, in the second paragraph, you talked about having 60,000 people who signed up for um, email um, contact. Can you tell us more, are there other areas where you've begun to collect that information? Well, I guess there's two main areas. We are trying to encourage and improve the CRM system I mentioned, because that should be the customer service portal. I guess the other very basic area is when you do pay by ePay, we do collect email information up front. But I think in general, we want to work with you to figure out ways to better market the customer service portal because that should be the central place that we're collecting the information and that does feed directly into our databases so we have that contact information for future purposes. So you do pull the contact information from the portal? Yes. Okay, and um, I think in your testimony you also said that um, you pull, test you pull um, email addresses, let me just go back. Um, oh, in the welcome packages. Um, are you, are those are sent out to every new taxpayer? Right, under the local law passed uh, last year, any new homeowner, co-op owner, or condo owner receives a welcome package, and it's basically to inform them of information about the property tax system, we get the exemptions, but we also invite them and we give them a, a link right on the, uh, in the correspondence to go to the, it's really going to the CRM portal to set up an account. So it's partially, that's part of the marketing to get more people to use it. 
do you know how many people have um, um, supplied uh, an email address with the welcome package? And do you know how many system-wide um, people's emails you have uh, in your system? I think I, we do have different systems. I can, let me get back to you because I think some of them overlap. Like there could be people who are signing up for CRM and through either the welcome letters or just direct. And we also have, again, email information through payment mechanisms. But I can get you a more definitive number. Okay. All right. On the CRM application, it's currently available for use on the DOF's website. Can non-owners registered receive notices and bills, or is it limited to property owners or their official designee? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Sure. On the CRM application that's currently available for use on DOF's website, can non-owners register to receive notices and bills, or is it limited to property owners and or their official designee? We do have mechanisms for non-owners to receive it, or you can designate a representative. Um, CRM is designed primarily for the um, owner or direct rep. We do have other, like if you wanted to have a representative, we also, I mean a legal representative, we also need a power of attorney to be submitted with it. So there are the various mechanisms to sign up, you know, the non-owner, um, but we also want to make sure that the owner is authenticated for direct correspondence. Okay, so I'll just note also that um, when a user is prompted to update their mailing address, neither the user's property address or the mailing address is um, readily available on the website or visible. Is that intentional? Uh, you, can, you can basically, there's two mechanisms. The property address is kind of the official address. So that goes through our land records uh, to vet to make sure the property information is correct. Mailing addresses, as long as someone can authenticate that they're related to the property, can be updated more you know, straightforwardly because that's basically just a correspondence mechanism. So how does a property owner know uh, when they need to update something? If it, can they see that if, um, so that they know whether or not to update it? Well, I guess that, you know, basically we're, we, it, it's proactively, if people have a change of address, they can notify us. Um, if we receive, um, sometimes if we, re if we mail to address and we're not getting, we get a return mail, we'll send it to the property address to just notify them that there's a, you know, we're not getting the mailing address may not be correct. Okay, good. Are there any hurdles that the DOF has identified with respect to collecting and maintaining the information? I'm sorry, I need to repeat it. Any hurdles? What? Any hurdles that we have had for collecting the information? Um, you know, basically, it's basically marketing it. We're trying to improve the portals to, um, you know, for the change of address, for example, we are trying to make it a much more automated process, but part of that would also be having filters to make sure that a new address is, if we're doing it automatically, that it's, it's, it's legitimate. Um, and the other thing we're trying to do with a lot of address information is upfront screening of the addresses that they meet standard protocols. So it's really, I think, more of a marketing issue to um, expand the knowledge that this is available. Thanks, Commissioner. I was glad to see that you um, couldn't hear as well. Uh, oftentimes there's an echo here, and I feel it was me who uh -huh. couldn't hear as well, so I appreciate that, believe me. Um, they have a little head cold with a little congestion. Yes. <laughs> um, and let me ask you some questions about the payment applications. Um, property owners are able to pay their bills online, in person, at a DOF business center, and by mail. For each of these methods, can you walk us through step by step how the money gets from the taxpayer until it is applied uh, to their account? So we're interested in knowing what happens, how long it takes to be posted, that process. I'll give you our payment operations person. I'll try, thank you. Um, so these are generalities. Um, when somebody comes into a business center, they either have a bill or they present their block and lot. That information gets scanned in by the cashier and it's an automatic update to their account, and the taxpayer will see that the next day. So it's an overnight process. The payment gets made on the internet, depending on the time of day. If it's like before three o'clock, um, that payment gets processed that same day, and the homeowner can see that 
payment processed immediately. If it's after five, then they'll see it the next day. Um, in both of those cases, they get a receipt upon payment. In the case of sending us in a payment, they mail in the payment to the lockbox, which um, process, opens and sorts and processes the mail. It generally takes about two days to get to the, from the post office to the lockbox, and it probably takes a day to process, and so then the payment gets data captured using the date on the envelope. And within the day, and the day that they um, got the, the postmark was credited is the day they get the credit for the money. Um, and then their canceled check is their receipt. Are there times of the year where um, it takes longer, where there's a, a higher volume of, um, of uh, checks coming in or um, e emails or payments being made online? Maybe not so much online, because I think that that process works, whether it's peak season or not peak season, but I'm sure the human touch um, slows down a wee bit when it's a peak season and there's a lot of mail coming in. At the third party transfer hearing that the council held in July, we heard testimony from a gentleman who made a property tax payment by mail on behalf of his mother. He testified that the DOF deposited the check and that the money was deducted from his bank account, but that the money was not applied to his mother's property um, account. Can you explain why this might have occurred there? And are there ever times when you uh, will accept money but delay applying it to an account? So I'm thinking the only way that would happen is if there was a human error or the borough block and lot was not visible on the coupon or on the check, and nobody knew where to put, how, where to deposit it properly. Okay. Um, can you please provide the committee with an update on the rollout of the new property tax system? Okay, so I think as you know, we launched a new property tax system last spring, and the big, one big milestone was our most recent billing cycle with the statement of account that went out in June. Uh, and generally, we're very pleased with the rollout. There have been transition issues. I think one of the things we're, we're trying to do is just respond to any issues that come up as quickly as possible. But systematically, uh, we think it's been a success. And you know, the, main, the main, main, fe main feature that this will provide for finance going forward is, is an enterprise system. So it's something we can build on. We can you know, develop more interactions with our other systems. You know, it's a multi-step process. But uh, we feel that the initial launch went successfully. So um, are there any significant milestones that have not yet been achieved in the planned rollout? Um, and if so, can you describe the timeline for those? Well, yeah, the main, mi main milestones for operational are kind of driven by the calendar of when payments are need to go out. The, the a notice of property value will have to go out in January. So, you know, we have both the quarterly and semi-annual billings and that. And the other thing is the enhancements of functionality. So. We think it is a major success that now we have e-filing capability for exemption programs so that people can go online. I mean, there's two fronts of that. One's the technology. The other part is we are working to simplify a lot of the application processes so that documents that are submitted become minimized. You know, a lot of that is through back-end checking that if we have information from other sources, like personal income tax returns on income, then we can do some pre-vetting that we know certain populations are eligible. They just have to then check a box. But uh, as far as PTS has allowed it to be an e-filing process. Do you plan on putting back the data that was uh, used to be available publicly? On the new system currently, NOPV information only goes back to fiscal 2011. Uh, tax bill information only goes back to fiscal 2010. And assessment roll information only goes back to fiscal 2014. Well, we are working on two fronts, one to you know, to make sure the data is available. As far as going back, we are trying to analyze where we can go back and provide information that, you know, customers may have been used to getting in the past. One, one uh, feature we are now unrolling is more AV historical information that could be available. I mean, so yes, there are some issues. We're in transition. Uh, we are trying to provide, you know, we're both trying to evaluate what customers really need, not just historically what was given. And so we're trying to get feedback from a lot of interest groups as to the data they need. 
Uh, and on the other front is we are moving data to the open data portal so that everyone can use it. I mean, I think the one hurdle with the open data portal is it needs good indexing. So we are also trying to make sure that if you need information and it's available and it's not directly on PTS, you can go to the open data portal and get it. But as far as the specifics, we're currently evaluating and working with interest groups to try to provide more information. So is that how you're soliciting feedback, by working with those interest groups? You can, you can get information through PTS directly and you can go to the open data portal for historical information. Uh, in July, the New York Post ran an article that was critical of the PTS rollout. One of the problems that they noted with that was that there was uh, old unknown charges were popping up plus interest. Uh, this was an issue that was also brought to my office's attention through a number of constituent complaints. I want to thank Sheila Feinberg for helping me with the constituent case as well. But did you identify this as a problem that was related to the PTS rollout? And if so, how widespread was that issue? And what has been done to correct it? Well, I think some of the issues we've seen with PTS actually uh, reflects data and conversion issues with the old system. That, you know, things are popping up that we're trying to clean up. So there was a major conversion data cleanup, but some of the issues that we're, we're, we're kind of dealing with right now are just um, cleaning up data that really is historical data that uh, had issues in the first place. So I think that we're pretty much, you know, we do have a queue. We have a regular group that's going through. We try to be attentive anytime somebody raises an issue. In fact, often what we're doing is bringing in interested parties to discuss with us the specifics. So if we, you can tell, is it an isolated issue or is it a more systemic issue? And um, at this point, I think we're pretty fast in addressing the issues that are coming up. So in this case, I think it was uh, that interest was charged on a retroactive payment that was made already or whatever. So I think we had actually even more than one case. I think we referred about three cases over. Did you find any other cases or was it just specific to those three Are you cases? Are you familiar with this? I think I have to know more specifics, but I think what we were, I think it's just what uh, Michael was just referring to. You know, we, we always ask when constituents come in with these kind of cases or any other cases related to PTS, is this an isolated situation? Are there other similar cases? And when we can dig through with our working group, we have a working group that has a call every morning to go through some of these issues, we can fine tune our response and fine tune just where the problem is occurring. I think in your case, we were finding some other cases. And I think as Michael alluded to earlier, we were able to solve those cases as well. Okay, I mean, it was a minimal amount of money, but still taxpayers did complain, so. Okay, uh, what was the final cost of uh, PTS and uh, do you anticipate any additional ongoing costs? I think the cost of PTS, and we're combining both the capital plus um, personal services that includes finance staff is, is currently at $41 million. I think the main costs going forward are just maintenance costs. So that includes the vendor charges plus personnel costs plus any contractors that were used as part of the transition. So the bulk of the cost has been, uh, you know, that's the money. And then ongoing, there's just like ongoing maintenance costs. Okay. With the implementation of PTS, the development of the CRM and the new ability to fill out um, forms and applications online, the DOF now has uh, much more customer service functionality. When was the last time you did a holistic review of the website design to ensure it's customer friendly? Um, I think sometimes when you go on, you have to click one area and then go to another area and finally you wind up going to a third area or a fourth area. So is any work being done on that? Well, I do, I, I say one thing, I think the CRM portal needs to be highlighted more, but go ahead. So I would start off with thank you for bringing that to our attention. You know, we are all really excited by CRM and the potential that it has to access to get our customer information and for people to really join the 21st century and for DOF to join the 21st century and meeting the customers where they are. For the website specifically, you know, we are always looking at it to how we can improve it. There's a lot of information that we need to post uh, by laws, uh, by local law and state law. So sometimes I think that crowds the information on the website, but that's, that's a welcome suggestion. I think we're, we were just talking beforehand how we could highlight CRM on the website, on the homepage. So when you've done website redesign in the past, did you use in-house folks to do it or did you uh, contract it out? I believe we did in-house. Uh, DOF publishes uh, two property tax guides 
for class one and class two home homeowners, which were designed, <coughs> excuse me, before much of this additional functionality was added to the website. Have you considered updating uh, those guides to better reflect all the tools available uh, to property owners online? So I would just back up a little bit more and say, all of our materials are constantly under review. We wanna use plain language when we're talking about our tax rates, our NOPVs, we're always constantly reviewing our documents and how we can make them more accessible to the general public and to our customers. To your question about the class one and class two guides, that is something that's going through review right now. I think it went through review previously. The NOPV also went through some review and we launched a new NOPV. So again, that's something that we would be thinking about. So I'll, I'll just hold there. Okay. Um, you recently revised the uh, notice of property value forms in an effort to increase clarity, but this also made these forms three pages long rather than two pages long. You spoke a little bit about that before. How much did this extra page add to the mailing cost of those NOPVs? We would have to go back to our vendor to get an exact quote for you, but I think it would affect the postage cost, and it would, affect, you know, and obviously we do our mailings to 1.3 properties, so that would, you know, I don't know exactly, but it could be significant. It could not. I don't know. Okay. And is there any consideration to similarly update the format of the property tax bills to improve clarity? Yes, that is certainly something that we want to address uh, to improve clarity. I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding where the exemptions fit into the tax bills and how much they currently owe. As a friendly reminder, when you go to PTS, you can see your current status of your account. So you can see on PTS exactly what you owe. And I think there's sometimes a lag of when the tax bills go out. So it's just mirroring that. Okay, I want to say that we have been joined by uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. Council Members Powers, Lansman, and Joni, and we have questions from Council Members Matteo, Vallone, and Grudenchik. So we'll go now to uh, Minority Leader Matteo. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, I just want to talk about the receipt for payment. Um, I think in the testimony you said definitely the one time you offer a receipt is when someone pays in person and they get a paper receipt, I assume? Yes? You get when you pay in person, you get when you e pay, you do get an acknowledgement of the payment. I'm sorry? When, I guess when you pay in person, you get a receipt. When you e pay, you also get an uh, email acknowledgement of the payment. Is that a downloadable receipt or is that just an email that says you paid it? No, it's a downloadable receipt on electronic. That's attached to the email or embedded in the email? It's a confirmation that you made is your mic? Yeah. Sorry. It's a confirmation that you've made your payment. Is that, but is that an actual receipt, receipt or, or just a confirm? I think, I mean, I view confirmations and receipts are two different things. Um, what would is it just it? saying like, hey, you paid $50 today or is it actual, I could download a receipt that says that I- Download the receipt and it says I paid $50 today to this block and lot on this time okay. on this day. Um, so when a mortgage company or a non-property owner pays property taxes on behalf of the owner, is there um, receive any con uh, confirmation of the payment? Or do you have to look online once, th once that's made? So you're paying by check? No. Well, if you pay by mortgage check, company then you're gonna could get back your canceled check. If you're paying electronically, um, then you have to go online. I'm saying that when the, a lot of homeowners, especially in my district, pay the mortgage pays the, so there's no receipt or anything, you just have to check online that's that it was right. actually paid. That's true. Although one, that's one thing we're working on is like in our property tax system, there is a, you know, a page you can see payments being made and where they're applied. So we are trying to convert that into a receipt type document so that you can go online and get a record that for like for the most recent quarter, a pay payment has been accredited to that account. But that's not instant, right? That's, well, that's like how long can you see it? Every quarter, I guess you're saying? Well, you go into the portal, there's a page you open up. You, right now, if you go into a page, I think it's the account history page, you can see that for this quarter I owed $3,000, a payment of $3,000 was made. So your, your balance is zero. So what we're trying to do is make that into a more user-friendly format so you can have a document that you can download and print out. Okay, do you know, I don't know if you know this answer, but do you know the percent of properties that usually pay taxes by their mortgage? Um. 
maybe half. Half? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about property tax overpayments. So when, when someone pays an overpayment on their bill, maybe through their mortgage or they just made an overpayment, what exactly does finance do with that overpayment? Do they, re do they refund it? Do they give a receipt that there was an overpayment? Do they apply it to the next bill? They give the bill all of the above. So if you um, owe us money for a prior period, we take that overpayment and we apply it to your older debt. Automatically? Yeah. Okay. As long as you continue to own the house. Right? There's no change in ownership. As long no. as there's no change in ownership, if I pay $100 extra on my property tax bill. But you owe me money from two years ago. We're you will, take that you will add in. that without me telling you what to I do will. with that overpayment. That's correct. And if you um, owe us no money and you have a strict overpayment, we'll refund it. And you, you, so you won't apply it to the next bill no matter what? Uh, usually we'll refund it. It's better. If the, if the person says, can you apply this? Oh, yes, we can apply it, absolutely. But it has to yes. come from us? Yes. Right? Yes. The request comes, so if I say, please put $200 towards my next bill? My next bill, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, questions from uh, Councilmember Vallone. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I think we're all on the same page. We're all trying to create user accessibility on different fronts and generational access as the system changes. My bill is pretty simple about an additional phone call, but as we talked this morning, I think more ideas percolate on, on the comments that you said and the chair brought up. So the welcome package, how is the information, how are you getting the information to provide the welcome package? Where is that information coming from that that's being presented? Well, the welcome letter basic, ha basically has basic information and links to where you can go to get additional information. And no, I know what's on the package, but how did you know to send it to me. Oh, we basically is from transfer ta transfer information. You know, basically we look at from our ACRA system wh who's purchasing properties. Again, it's co-op owners. We it started with homeowners and condo owners. We expanded it to co-op owners, uh, even though the you know there are shares of a. So is the burden or the onus on you to, through ACRAS to determine that information? Because where I'm going is after doing 25 years of closings. The time is a very confusing time for anyone, whether they're purchasing their first home or reselling their lifelong home and, or seller, or a senior is getting um, uh, additional financing or reverse mortgage. It's the only time in the life you're gonna have a lawyer, title company, and a bank mm -hmm. at the person's disposal. And I'm thinking we create a mandatory document or a 30-day period that the portal must be created at the time of closing and have the assistance of those professionals created for the actual buyer, mm -hmm. so that that nervous process and understanding this process, especially the generational with my seniors, or all senior, can have that assistance. Because once that closing's over, and once that clock is over, then we're on their own. Now, I'll just tell you from my years of doing elder law for 85 years with our family, we may have this conversation, but time after time, people come in and they just are overwhelmed, especially our seniors. So no matter what we create, this might be good for the new generation, but those above 60 are, are not going to be able to handle this process. So I'm thinking we create the assistance for our seniors at a time when they're coming for need, whether it's a refinance or a transfer to a trust or some type of family familiar situation where a power of attorney is created, where DOF then has a form that we make mandatory that either a title company, the banks, the lawyers must fill out, similar to with ACRIS, Mm -hmm. to be part of that portal system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you kids can't even join a sports league now without creating, you can't get on the field without first being part of that online system. You can't go to high school, you can't go to college, you can't get financial assistance without being part of whatever portal system you're doing. So I think we can take that step and it wouldn't be overly burdensome if we take those opportunities, like a closing, to make it mandatory so that you get that email information, you get that critical information sent, and then boom, the packets go out automatically. I mean, the phone call was just, I can't tell you how many phone calls we all get as council members on fear of losing their star or enhanced star or the she or the tree or whatever it is that they've held on to disability, veterans exemptions, the, the spouse passed away, am I gonna lose my, my husband's benefit? That's, till the end of time, those questions are gonna come. 
So I think what we're trying to do is not create another level of burdensome on the homeowners. We're trying to assist them to this new system. And I think those are some ideas. Just wanted to get your thoughts on, on maybe taking that opportunity to make this a requirement at the time of any of these transactions that the information you need for this portal is created at that time. I think it's, a, it's an idea worth pursuing. I mean, we would need to just kind of look at it the more, how do we do it systematically? I mean, for the example of the welcome letter, we now have it, a protocol as to when a transfer occurs, it has an automatic you know, process that's triggered. So I hear your point, expanding it to other type of transactions that are being done. So I think it's worth looking at, and if we can do it systematically, we should, we should discuss it. Yeah, I think your, your, your hope there is to making it a title requirement. So we'd have to work with the title companies to make that form mandatory, because we've passed the legislation before, and unless, it's, unless the title companies and it becomes mandatory within the banking association puts it part of their packets when they train their agents, it never happens. Mm -hmm. uh, we did this with re restrictive covenants. We made it mandatory that it be listed. We worked on this together doesn't happen mm -hmm. unless the title company works with at the time of the transaction putting it on the list for the department of finance to see it's a very similar situation so i would just offer that and i thank the chair for addressing this because it, it really is especially in districts like ours and all of queens and throughout the city the number one phone call and it's it's a senior in a time of need or someone's passed away or they can't handle things anymore and they see these new forms or they didn't get the mail or they didn't get a phone call Next thing you know, they're losing a key exemption that's keeping them in the house or the condo, and that's the last thing we want to do. So thank you, Chair. Councilmember Grzenczyk. Councilmember Jolanine. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's my understanding that roughly 10,000 new homeowners receive emails, receive this mailing each month uh, from the Department of Finance. Is that about roughly? Well, they receive a letter from us encouraging them to apply for benefits and to sign up for our CRM system so we have their email address. So but that, it just reflects what our data shows as to the transfers that are occurring per month. Of roughly the 120,000 mailings that go out, what is the return rate where people will actually take advantage of registering online? Yes. Well, we, we um, do we have that? We can, we'll get that. I'm sorry? We, we have, so we basically have 120,000 going up as far as how many are responding mm -hmm. on the online. We need to look at the data. We just have um, an overall number, right, of how many accounts we have. Right, we only know the current number of account holders with a CRM account. We don't know how they came to us yet. We're still figuring out and fine tuning our tracking systems, but I think that's something we would definitely want to be interested in. You, you make a great point. 120,000 letters are going out. How many are prompted to, we, while we prompt them, how many take action to enter into a, a CRM account? So we'll look into that. We don't have the exact number right now. Well, Chair, this should be important to figure out exactly what is the juice worth the squeeze in the form of mailings? And if we're not getting the return rate that we actually need, then we should be coming up with alternative ways and robocalls and uh, other manners, as my colleague also mentioned, uh, of mandatory um, portals uh, being part of the process. So one thing we're trying to take a close, closer look at is how do we incentivize by having more services on the portal? So that, you know, I think that first, right now it's a place you can go to get certain information, to ask questions and get responses. Um, as we said, we want to roll out a more chat, you know, um, mechanism in it. And we also want to make it a gateway that is a place you can go to get access to other sites and deal with that might be valuable. So we do think that the data is important, but we think as we uh, expand the functionality, it would also be more incentives for people to sign up. And what is your position on the robocalling or phone notifications? It doesn't sound like you're very excited well, uh, about Well, yeah, we this. certainly appreciate that phone calls can be an effective way to reach people. We are concerned, as most taxing jurisdictions are, with robocalling because, uh, as, you, as people know, you get a lot of robocalls, and they can, some not, they're not all illegitimate, but they can be you know, a scam device. So um, I think you know, the IRS, for example, will not do a robocall as an initial correspondence with someone. 
New York State Tax and Finance won't do it, and we, and as a taxing agency, we're concerned about you know, scam potential. That said, we all, we do think it could be effective to I mean, once we target a population of non-compliers. You know, so we basically last year when we did the renewal, I think there were four correspondences that went out. We simplified the application process. This year it will be online, or it's a well, the the, scre uh, the shihi is is a tw um, you know a two-year process. So the next time we renew, it'll be an easier process. We try to make it very streamlined. Just some basic questions: Are you still you know resident where you are, and are you in income eligible? And so the compliance rate was greater than 90 percent. But for the remaining population, you know, working with the council, phone calls can be effective. We are concerned about upfront robocalling tens of thousands of uh, seniors and disabled people because we think there is a scam potential or they, or they may be intimidated by it. But those scams can be done with or without your robocalling and they currently uh, are being done, as you pointed out, the IRS scams and other scams that have targeted seniors. This is about providing information. And if it's just a reminder that your uh, renewal, the renewal your renewal for the benefit that you're entitled, whether it be the SCRI or the, SCRI, the senior discount, the school tax and whatnot, this is just information that we're providing them that they should know and a reminder that they have to renew their process, their forms. No, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I guess we're concerned about recipients being a little bit intimidated by getting the calls if they're not clear what it is. And again, to us, it's like the general renewal rate is high, so we should be targeting the people who aren't responding. I mean, some of the non-responders are no longer eligible, but for the ones that um, should be getting the benefit, you know, we can have a more targeted outreach campaign, which could involve phone calls, but it won't, it'll, be, but, but it'll be after, from our perspective, after we've gotten the bulk of people to renew. And last year, we, for example, a lot of people, we were surprised, you know, when we began the outreach, how many people renewed early. We do attribute that to simplification of the renewal process, but it wasn't like people waited to the last month. A lot, a big chunk of the population renewed within the first few months of the first letter. One of the uh, issues that's constantly brought to my attention, especially by the seniors who no longer may have mortgages that don't pay their real estate, that don't have someone paying their real estate taxes for them, the concern is can you please find out if my payment was received and applied to my account correctly. They don't receive a receipt indicating that their taxes were paid. We've all heard of uh, terrible circumstances where a payment was made, it was incorrectly applied to another account, uh, the block and lot didn't match or was illegible and we've seen these nightmares. Numerous seniors come to me regularly asking to confirm that their tax payment was applied to their home so that they have a peace of mind. Why aren't we mailing them receipts? Well, I guess we're trying to, we're taking a multi-step approach. We're trying to do leverage what we can do quickly. I mean, one thing we can do quickly is to make sure that receipts are more look like more like receipts, that you have a document that kind of says for a period a payment has been made. We are working longer term to try to get to a point where there could be notifications. It's just, it, to be honest, it's a bigger technology lift. It's not so easy to, to, to have a system that does the automatic notification. So we're scoping out what the steps are. But as a near term, we're trying to make sure that the receipt is available to anyone who goes online. Um, right now, there are ways you can see payments that are being credited. I, I, I certainly appreciate it. It's not the simplest process, and for seniors, it may be confusing. So the first step is to have something which is a standalone, in effect, receipt that a payment's been made. It will be posted on our property tax system, and then we're trying to figure out ways to make it easier for people to get to that site. Mailing it out is something we would like to do, but it's just a longer-term technology project. Well, using technology when we can, but there are those that don't use technology that are concerned. My check went out, my check cleared. I can see that the money was pulled out of my account, but I don't, I'm not sure that it was applied to my home. And we've had, I'm sure we've all heard of the nightmares where tax payments were applied to incorrectly to a different block and lot. They just need a peace of mind and I understand their concerns, um, and it doesn't take much to make a senior uh, feel uncomfortable and certain, especially uh, when 
this is probably their single largest investment and the only asset that they own mm -hmm. uh, to receive a, a simple receipt, I don't think would be too demanding or uh, a burden on Department of Finance. Well, as I mentioned, what we appreciate what you're saying and we do support uh, uh, what you're saying. It's just going to be, we have to, and we can talk to your staff about it, we have to go through steps to actually implement um, a, having the receipt in a format that's user-friendly, B, trying to provide access to the receipt to anyone who wants it, and then the next step would be having a more notification process. But it is, from an IT perspective, it is a kind of a multi-step process, so we can give you more feedback once we have the IT people we discuss as to the timeline, but it's, it's not an overnight kind of functionality we can provide. The first step we're trying to provide is make sure receipts are available for any payment made and then work on ways of giving people greater access to it. So if you have somebody who's working with a senior and they want to just get easily pull up the information from our site, they can get it. And then the notification is the next step from an IT perspective. I understand your concerns, but I don't think it's as complicated as you make it. Normally it just says paid. Mm -hmm. Payment received, the dollar amount, the date it was applied, and your next payment due date is blank. I, it's a basic receipt used in almost every field and industry out there in a private sector. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that complicated from a public sector. Agreed. I, I would just again mention for your, for your office to know when you're working with seniors, you can go to the PTS system and you can see that the accounts have been made, uh, or excuse me, payments have been made in the current status of a senior's account. I mean, I think as Michael already iterated, it, it is a process that we have to take. It's not an overnight snap of the finger solution. We hear you and, and we will address it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I want to say that we have been joined by Councilmember Moya and Van Bramer. And I want to thank this panel for coming in and giving testimony today. Um, we will now hear from uh, members of the public. Thank you again for coming in. Thank you. Okay, Jenna Gladfetter from Live On New York. Hi there. Am I the only member here? Yep, okay. that's fine. Whenever you're <laughs> ready, you can begin. Yep. <laughs> okay. Hi, Jenna Gladfelder from Live On New York. Um, thank you, Chair Drom and the Full Finance Committee for the opportunity to testify today. Live On New York would also like to express our sincere appreciation for the Council's ongoing commitment to older New Yorkers. Uh, for 40 years, Live On New York has been supporting community-based organizations throughout the city that provide core services to older adults to allow them to thrive in their communities. To better support older adults and our base of more than 100 members, Live On New York administers a citywide outreach program that educates, screens, and enrolls older New Yorkers in critical benefits and entitlements such as SNAP, SCREE, and SHE. Our team works tirelessly to help older adults through the application and re-enrollment process and witnesses firsthand the positive impacts of these programs. Due to this work, Live On New York would like to specifically provide comment on intro 952. We applaud Cal Council Member Vallone for introducing legislation to help ensure that all older adults who are eligible for SHE are able to more easily re-enroll in the program. We recognize that this is a goal that is shared by the administration as efforts to, to ensure older adults retain benefits such as uh, she continue to in earnest by many uh, city officials, including the Department of Finance's outreach team. Live on New York is proud to work closely with this team as well as our numerous partners in city council to ensure a client-centered approach to outreach to combat the historic underutilization of benefits experienced by older adults. Unfortunately, our work faces significant challenges. In today's digital age, many, if not all of us, are all too familiar with receiving calls from scammers and identity thieves. As a result of the spike in cyber crimes in recent years, many government agencies, businesses, and community-based organizations now offer education on how to protect oneself from identity theft and scams, directing much of its education toward older adults who are viewed by scammers as particularly vulnerable. According to the Federal Trade Commission, the primary method by which scammers initiate contact is by phone, according to 69% of fraud reports submitted in 2018. 
Because of this, Live on New York has found through our outreach work that many older adults are now hesitant to answer their phones unless they immediately recognize the number. Further, many are wary to trust the information left in voicemail messages due to the high number of government imposter scams. Live on New York is happy to support increased outreach to older New Yorkers, especially around such critical benefits. However, recognizing the city's limited resources, we thought it important to share the reluctance many older adults have to answer or discuss financial matters on the phone as a point of consideration around um, this proposal. Live on New York is proud to work with City Council and the Department of Finance to continue to combat barriers to re-enrollment and critical benefits among older adults, and we're happy to support the outreach methods determined successful and appropriate by both the Council and the Department of Finance. Thank you so much for letting me testify today. So it seems to me, although I don't think you were di as direct, that you're in opposition to uh, the legislation. Um, I think that uh, I actually have our benefits outreach team program director here today as well um, to, to support this. And I think from what I gathered from our team, the way that the Department of Finance is um, initiating the re-enrollment process with SCREE has been particularly uh, successful. So if there's a way that maybe that could be considered to be rec replicated or something along those lines, um, we think that might be potentially more successful. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, um, the concerns of uh, the administration are, are valid, you believe? Um, we believe so. We have worked very closely with them, to my understanding, and, um, and in our work as well, we have seen uh, those kinds of barriers as well. And when you talk about the outreach done for scree injury, um, are you talking about um, the notifications from uh, DOF specifically or and or from council members because a number of council members do do their own outreach once they get the list. Um, from what I understand uh, the the way in which SCREE renewal the re SCREE renewal process is um, communicated with recipients is um, through mail and I believe it is through several several letters that are sent out um, and we have found that that's been successful from working with clients and hearing from them as well. You know, one of the things we've wished in my office is that we had telephone numbers for the seniors so that we could call them. Do you think that if they received a personal phone call from a council member's office, um, they would not believe us? Or um, do you think that's more effective than a robocall? I think that would be more effective than a robocall, for sure. Um, having a personal um, I think uh, just across the board, a lot of us tend to be, I mean, we all receive, um, you know, scam calls and everything, and robocalls, I think, put us a, immediately a little bit more on defense, so a more personal call might be uh, more successful. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate you coming in and giving testimony. Thank, thank you. Thank you very you. much. We have been joined by Councilmember Cornegy. Uh, did you yes. want to ask a question? Yeah, at the risk of it having been asked already, I'm just going to ask. Um, a few years ago, the um, threshold increased for SCREE. Yes. Can you tell me how many people have benefited from the e increase, do you know, at this time? And, and, and how are people being informed that they may be eligible now based on the increase? I, I do not know those numbers, anything or off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to um, speak with our team here and get back to you on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious because so many more New Yorkers have an opportunity to benefit from the program with the increase. There were, there were teachers and, and people who had, who had pensions who were excluded in the, with the prior numbers. Um, and then I guess from a council perspective, what can we do um, in collaboration with your office to, to um, get the work or get the information out to folks? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in the since that has happened, um, since the threshold was raised, I know that Live on New York's outreach team has worked very hard to do that education, but of course there are so many people to be reached. Um, so we would be happy to speak with you more about how we can get that message out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very, very much. For coming thank you. On. Appreciate it. Um, unless there are any other questions, uh, Council Member? All right, then this meeting is adjourned at 11.26 in the morning. Thank you.